All right, we got 2024 presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy here now to weigh in. I want to, Vivek, thanks for being here, by the way. I want to get right to this AI. This, yeah. this story I find particularly chilling, but it's in the context of this larger conversation on AI. Elon Musk making some news by saying, hey, you know what? We really need to regulate AI just the way we do a lot of other products that might be unsafe. But I look at the regulatory bureaucracy, frankly, mm-hmm. and I see a lot of things that I wouldn't want involved with AI. How do you think about dealing with this? So the way I see the advances in AI right now are similar to the advances in gain of function research. In the name of helping humanity, we actually created a global pandemic. Well, with AI, in the name of providing tools that can actually help human beings live better lives, we may create actual real human risks. So I think Elon Musk is correct to put his finger on the problem. But here's the thing. We cannot adopt constraints here in the United States if, say, places like China are not adopting those same constraints. Mm. In fact, the gain-of-function research story ended up in the same place, where actually ended up being a Wuhan lab, even though we banned it here, that gave us a global pandemic. Similarly, we're not going to accomplish anything by applying a straitjacket in the United States if places like China are not adopting the same constraints. That's what makes this so complicated. So is it full throttle on AI? Full throttle, don't hold back, no pause, go. Well, I think that what we need is actual leadership on this, where... Everybody needs to adopt the same constraints at the same time, or else the U.S. is going to be at a disadvantage. But I do think that there are certain, the main risk that I see with AI, actually, it was embodied in that story, is the human being's response to the AI. Mm. Because human beings have a response to say that AI, because it's AI, it is an authority. No, it is not, actually. We need to be able to actually train the next generation to see that just because it's AI doesn't mean it's Mm. true. That's actually very important. Mm. I want to talk about our relationship with China. Mm Mm-hmm. If you were to be president, how do you think about foreign policy, economic ties? We can't decouple, right? So how do you think about that relationship? So respectfully, I actually disagree with you on that. I think we have an opportunity to decouple from China. And here's the challenge. Even with Reagan and the USSR, we never relied on the Soviet Union for the shoes on our feet or the phones in our pockets. Today, we're reliant on our enemy for our modern way of life. Codependent relationships do not end well. The only question is who ends it first. And I think the sooner we end it, the better for us. It's not as hard as we make it out to be. Because decoupling from China does not necessarily mean onshoring all of that to the U.S. Mm -hmm. We have Japan, South Korea, Mm -hmm. India, Thailand, Philippines, Australia, Vietnam, even Brazil, other parts of the world. We make this out to be more difficult than it is. Mm. It will require preparedness to make some sacrifice. But I will sit across the table from Xi Jinping and I will tell him, We are prepared to go the distance of even banning most U.S. businesses from doing business in China unless you reform. No intellectual property theft, data theft. We're done with that. China's in a tougher spot than we are. They will fold if we actually have the fortitude to deliver that message. It's going to take an outsider to do it. It's a big part of why I'm in this. And that's part of the problem, right? Nobody is sitting down with Xi Jinping right now and having those very frank conversations and explaining how things are going to be. I think about this analogy that you made with gain-of-function research, um, you know, that we can't stop uh, if they're not stopping. And then I think about climate change, for example. Here in the United States, President Biden wants to completely overhaul uh, our whole country, uh, our whole automotive system, um, at a massive cost to American consumers when we constantly are saying, well, if China doesn't adapt, and India doesn't contribute, then what are we doing? It's just a drop in the bucket. Yet he's pressing forward. That's why it scares me. We don't see the foes adapting the way we want them to. Well, I think a lot of the anti-carbon agenda in the U.S. is itself based on false premises. But China's laughing at every step where we might force American energy companies to abandon oil projects where literally the likes of PetroChina are buying them up on the other side of the world. The same ESG-promoting asset managers that force the likes of Chevron to drop them don't say a peep as PetroChina picks them up. So this is a game that really China's using to advantage themselves versus the United States. And I think in this particular case, we need to abandon that climate cult to be able to make sure we're not competitively disadvantaged versus China. But do you see how if they continue that and they they sort of do the same thing with AI, how dangerous it could be? That's really what I'm getting at here. Absolutely. They're laughing at every step. And either They've even done it with weaponizing our own social mores back against us. Think about that actually origin of the pandemic. They weaponized that to say anybody who claimed that it was a China virus or Wuhan virus was liable to an allegation of racism. Mm -hmm. So they're using our own insecurities back against us. And like I said, they're laughing at every step of the way. Vivek, great to see you as always. Thank you so much for stopping by. It's good to see you guys. Thank you. You'll have a lot to solve if you end up in that seat. (laughs) We're ready for the challenge. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right.